Okay, let's take a look at a few more details about the circulatory system or the cardiovascular system or according to the syllabus, we call it the transport system. And that's interesting because we're going to talk about this guy really quick. William Harvey is the one who kind of helped us understand that it is a transport system. Because before this guy, uh, the previous ideas before William Harvey's suggestions were that the blood pretty much doesn't really move around the body. Um, it's that uh, this guy named Galen believed that the blood was produced by the liver, pumped up by the heart, and then it actually kind of just stayed emotionless. And so this even led to practices such as bloodletting. So Galen believed that the body was made up of only four types of fluids and blood was one of them. And sickness was often the result of blood getting stuck somewhere and not moving and becoming stale. And so one of the practices was to therefore cut and allow people to bleed um, and try to remove that diseased blood. Obviously, back in those days, several hundred years ago, uh, anytime you cut somebody open, you're going to be in the be in danger of letting in all kinds of uh, bacteria, which can cause other types of problems. And so one of the other solutions was to use millions of leeches. And I think I read somewhere in France was very big on this and France imported leeches to actually deal with this. And one of the treatments that was suggested was to pretty much put up to 50 leeches on the diseased body part. And it's kind of a, you know, different parts of the body were linked kind of like, um, what is it? acupuncture in different parts of the body, like the bottom of the foot, you know, connected to another part of the arm or something like that. So if you had a problem in your arm, then they might let out blood from a different part of the body. Very interesting stuff. But uh, believe it or not, that was pretty much gold, um, this idea. And I put Game of Thrones here because there's a few scenes where, or one scene, where some leeches are being used to help uh, cleanse uh, the poison blood or to actually, what was it? I think to take out some of the, the blood. Anyways, I can't remember. It's just, it's so violent. I love it. Anyway, so William Harvey was the guy who suggested that uh, blood is pumped out and it goes in one direction all the way around and then comes back around. And this, this idea of circulation, uh, he demonstrated before they had the ability to see little types of things and with microscopes, he demonstrated the presence of arteries and veins and predicted the presence of tiny, tiny little, almost invisible blood vessels called capillaries that could deliver all the important nutrients around the body. And so this idea led to something called the double circulatory system. So we have a heart here and you've already practiced this. Hopefully you've been able to identify parts of the heart and are able to draw either the actual form or draw like a diagram form. We'll see on the next slide a little bit. In one of the other videos I've described how in detail to draw that diagram. So you don't have to memorize the structure of the heart, but you think logically and you can kind of figure out where everything's moving around. So it ends up in two types of circulation, pulmonary. Uh, pulmonary refers to anything to do with the lungs. I like to think that the word pulmonary reminds me of the word lungs. So that makes a lot of sense, kind of. And then the other type of circulation is systemic circulation, which means moving the blood actually around the body. And so the left side of the heart, so if you're looking, pretending like you're looking at somebody dead here laying on the paper face up, then this would be the left side of the heart and this would be the right side of the heart. The left side of the heart is responsible for pumping things out through systemic circulation with lots of oxygenated blood all over the body and then it returns back and the right side of the heart is responsible for pumping it out to the lungs in order to pick up more oxygen so that we can bring it back to the heart with oxygenated blood so we can feed all of our cells. Okay, so here's another diagram of the heart. Uh, you should be able to recognize a few of these things. There's different names for these valves, but I think to keep it simple, uh, if you just think of the valves that are located in between the atria and the ventricles, those are atrioventricular valves. So I think that's going to be the easiest way to go about this. And that's how the syllabus approaches this as well, too. So these valves are atrioventricular valves. And then these valves over here in between, depending on the type of diagram you're looking at, those are called the semilunar valves. And so in the next slide, we're going to be seeing how pressure changes inside the atria and in the ventricles and also in the aorta. And it's going to be important to keep track of all of that. Uh, rather than memorizing all the different bits and pieces, try to think about the heart as it pumps, right? The atria pump and then the ventricles pump. So the top 
the top half squeezes. I wish I'm, I'm squeezing my fist together, but you can't see that obviously. So this top half squeezes, goes boom, boom. And then this part squeezes, goes boom. And then this part squeezes. And then, so if you think about that, you can predict which valves will be open at which times. Um, you'll see more about this a little bit later, but the cardiac muscle, you know, there's a few different types of muscle that are in the body. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart and it kind of beats on its own. So it has this special property. We call it myogenic contraction. It means it can contract without stimulation. Things can alter the rate at which it, it's actually uh, pumping, which we'll, you'll see in another video or another slide, but um, it does pump on its own. So if I reached into your body and pulled out your heart, Indiana Jones style, sorry if my references are very old, I'm getting old myself, and I held your heart up to the sky as a sacrifice, it would still be pumping for a while and it didn't, doesn't need to be connected to anything and that tissue is still going to pump as long as there's still oxygen, a little bit of oxygen left in there. Um, so the ventricles are the pumping chambers, uh, the atria are the collecting chambers. There are going to be valves here that prevent backflow of the blood and so you're going to see that with the pressure changes a little bit. Okay, one thing not to get confused about is everyone thinks, okay, here's the heart and I know there's gonna be oxygenated blood inside these chambers when it comes back from the lungs. But the funny thing is that the tissues of the heart itself are not actually being fed by the oxygenated blood directly inside the chamber. It actually has to come out the aorta, okay? The oxygenated blood comes out the left ventricle, out the aorta, and then it quickly branches off and goes to different parts of the body, but some of it also connects back into what we call the coronary arteries. So when you're doing a heart dissection, you look at any diagram of heart from the outside, not a cut through version on the inside, but any heart from the outside, you're gonna see these arteries running down and these are called coronary arteries. These are the ones that supply the actual um, cardiac muscle, the tissue of the actual heart with oxygen. And when these things get clogged, that's when you hear about all kinds of problems that can go wrong with the heart and the coronary arteries getting clogged and stuff like that. So the coronary arteries are supplying the heart with the blood containing the nutrients and the oxygen. That oxygen obviously is being used for cell respiration combined together with glucose uh, to order, in order to provide the ATP to allow the tissues to stay alive and still be able to uh, pump everything around. So the blood supply to the tissues is not coming from inside the actual heart tissues and diffusing uh, inside the left ventricle and diffusing into the tissues. It's actually coming out through the aorta just like every other tissue is getting its oxygen from and part of it's gonna branch off and is gonna come out and actually feed the coronary arteries on the outside. So obviously there's something called coronary artery disease and coronary artery, arter, uh, can't say it, coronary artery disease, try saying that 50 times. You can probably say it five times, 50 times is hard. Coronary artery disease, wow, that's still difficult to say. Coronary artery disease is still a problem. Uh, you've heard about all kinds of things where you can get lipid deposits that are showing up there and there's lots of risk factors. Hopefully you're not doing anything in your life right now that's contributing to your possibility of developing coronary artery disease in the future. But the fancy word here is occlusion, basically means it's getting blocked off. So this lumen, this area here is actually becoming more narrow because it's being blocked off by this fatty plaque buildup, which is obviously going to restrict the blood flow uh, minerals can get deposited as the blood is actually flowing through and can actually increase its hardness, making it even more difficult to fix. Um, some causes, obviously, uh, smoking, high blood pressure, and there are various genetic factors as well, too. If you don't know what a coronary bypass surgery is, uh, you should check that out. It's actually, it sounds really high tech, but all it is is you're basically taking out a vein from some part of your body like the, like, like the arm and they're actually building a little tube that can bypass where the blockage is. It's not actually fixing the blockage. It's saying, okay, the blood can't flow through here, so let's build another channel from here to the other side, uh, from the aorta, sorry, to the other side of the blockage. And so it's very low tech, which is probably the best way to say it, but it works, you know? If water can't get through a particular tube, then and you can't get rid of that blockage, then you build another pipe around the outside, and that's literally what a coronary bypass surgery is. If they call it a quadruple bypass, then basically they're making four different channels 
for blood to go around the possible different places that uh, the fatty plaques have built up. So yeah, some pretty interesting stuff. Try to avoid coronary artery disease and don't do anything that can contribute to the risk factors that you may already have.